tutorial and explanation video on bonding. Today I'm going to be teaching you about different topics regarding bonding and work you through some problems so in no time you will be an expert in this subject. Throughout this video, we are going to be going over different topics which relate to bonding, such as the difference between ionic and covalent bonds, how to draw Lewis structures, types of bonds, and Vesper. So let's start off by talking about the difference between ionic and covalent bonding. Both ionic and covalent bonds are something called chemical bonds. And chemical bonds are bonds which help bind different atoms together. So both ionic and covalent bonds are chemical bonds. And within ionic bonds itself, we have an attraction, an electrical attraction between cations and anions, or positives and negatives. We have an attraction between them. And an example of an ionic uh, compound is gonna be NaCl. In NaCl, we have both a positive and a negative. And we can see that here on our periodic table of elements. We see Na, has one valence electron, and Cl has seven. Additionally, Na is positive, while Cl is negative. So we have Na, which is positive, and Cl, which is negative. And since Na has one valence electron and Cl has seven, we want to make sure they both become stable. So Na transfers one of its electrons to Cl, so that Cl has eight. So in ionic bonding, we have a transfer, a transfer of electrons. And you'll also notice in ionic bonding that we have a metal and a non-metal. So another way we can think of ionic bonding is metals bonding with non-metals. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have our covalent bonding. And covalent bonding is not metals and nonmetals, it's actually nonmetals and nonmetals together. And let's see an example of a covalent bonding. So an example would be N2. Two nitrogens. If we were to look at the periodic table of elements, we will see that N is a nonmetal. And if we have two nitrogens together, those are two nonmetals together. Therefore, covalent bonding is two nonmetals. And in covalent bonding, rather than having the transfer electrons, we actually have electrons being shared together. So now that you know the difference between ionic and covalent bonding, we're going to go ahead and take a look at how to draw Lewis structures. A Lewis structure shows how the valence electrons are arranged around an atom and how they're shared with other atoms. And before we go ahead and start drawing these Lewis structures, we need to go over some basic rules. So let's write them down. So the first rule that we have is the octet rule. The octet rule states that usually in a compound, each atom must have eight electrons. The second rule is the duet rule. And the duet rule says that there are some exceptions to the octet rule where the atom needs two electrons, not eight. And an example of this is hydrogen. Our third rule is that all of the electrons must be used. And right now, that might not really make sense. Which electrons? What are we talking about? Well, we're gonna go into that into our first example. Our last rule is that the least electronegative element must be the central atom. But there are some exceptions. If we have carbon, then carbon automatically becomes the central atom. And if we have hydrogen, then hydrogen for sure is not the central atom. So hydrogen is never the central atom. Carbon, on the other hand, 
will this into autumn if we have it. So with these four rules, we can go ahead and start drawing our Lua structures. Okay, so now that we have our basic rules down, we're gonna go ahead and try to draw our first Lua structure, and we're gonna do CH4. We're gonna try it on Lua structure of CH4. And I've written the rules that we just talked about on the side of the whiteboard. So we're gonna kind of use them as guidelines to make sure that we're staying on the right track and that whatever Lua structure we draw satisfies all of the rules that we have written and that we have learned. So the first step of drawing a Lua structure is to add up the total number of valence electrons. So we can do this by looking at our periodic table and seeing how many valence electrons are in our carbon and are in our hydrogen. If we look at our periodic table, we see that carbon has four valence electrons. And we see that hydrogen over here has one valence electron. But we have to remember, we have four hydrogens. And this means we need to account for each of our hydrogens. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a one, one valence electron for each of the hydrogens that we have. Now, when we add this all up, we see that we have in total eight valence electrons that we're gonna be using. Okay, the second step is to figure out what our central atom is. Now, if we look at our rules, we see that the least electronegative element is going to be our central atom, unless we have carbon, which becomes the central atom, or we have hydrogen, which for sure isn't the central atom. Well, if we look at CH4, we see we have carbon. So that means carbon must be the central atom. So I'm going to draw carbon in the middle. And because central means middle, we're going to draw the hydrogens around the carbon. And we have to remember, this is a molecule. The hydrogens aren't just floating in space. They're kind of being attracted to the carbon. So we're gonna draw our bonds, our covalent bonds between our hydrogen and our carbon. Okay, so now that we've kind of had our basic structure down, we are going to wanna make sure we tweak it and adjust it based off of the guidelines. And we can go in any order, but I'm gonna work my way up from the bottom to the top. So the first rule we have is our central atom. And we see carbon over here is our central atom. So I'm gonna go ahead and check this off because we know that we did that correctly. Okay, the next thing is that all of the electrons are being used. Now, when I say that, I mean that we use eight electrons in our Lewis structure. And the way that we check that is by counting the number of electrons in this Lewis structure. Well, we know that one bond equals two electrons. So, in order to count how many electrons are in this Lewis structure, we can count up the bonds. This bond right here is two electrons. This bond here is two electrons. This one right here is also two, and this one right here is two. So if we add up all of these twos, we can see that in fact, we have eight electrons. So we know that all the electrons that we needed from over here are in fact being used. Okay, the next two rules we have are the do it and the octet rule. So the do it rule says that some elements like hydrogen, for example, must have two electrons attached to it. So we can take a look at the different uh, hydrogens here and make sure that there's only two electrons being attached to it. If I look at this hydrogen right here, I only see one bond attached to it. And it, as we know, one bond is two electrons. So this hydrogen right here is good to go. It has two electrons. This hydrogen right here also only has two electrons attached to it. 
this hydrogen also has two electrons attached to it. And finally, this hydrogen right here has two electrons attached to it. So we know that we've satisfied the duet rule. The last rule is the octet rule, which states that all other elements should have eight electrons attached to it. So the last, uh, the last element, which I haven't checked yet, is carbon. Let's take a look at carbon. Carbon, as we can see, has one, two, three, four bonds attached to it. And each bond is two electrons. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons attached to carbon. So therefore, carbon also is following the octet rule because carbon is being surrounded by eight electrons. So because all of our rules are being followed, we can say that this right here is the Lewis structure of CH4. So let's take a look at another example. So let's look at H2O. So again, our first step is that we want to add up the number of valence electrons. We have two hydrogens, so we're going to look and see hydrogen has one valence electron. So we're going to go one plus one for both of the hydrogens. And we're going to look at oxygen and see oxygen has six valence electrons. So I'm going to add a six. Altogether, we have eight valence electrons, just like our last example. Our second step is to figure out what is our central atom. Well, if we look at our rule, we see that the least electronegative element must be the central atom, unless we have carbon, which we don't hear, or hydrogen, and hydrogen is never the central atom. So therefore, we automatically know that oxygen must be the central atom. Because central means middle, we're gonna draw the other two hydrogens around the oxygen, and we're gonna go ahead and add in a bond, like so. I'm gonna go ahead and check off our least electronegative central atom rule because we already have our central atom down and it follows the rules. Okay, let's work our way up again. We see that all of the electrons must be used. Well, if you remember, each bond equals two electrons. So this means that we have two electrons here and two electrons here. Two plus two is four. So we've only used so far four electrons. However, we need to use eight electrons. So in order to make sure that we use all eight electrons, there are two different things we can do. Let's start with the first one. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a bond on the side. So we said that each bond is two electrons. So now we have two over here, two over here, and two over here. Well, that's six electrons. That's not eight. So what else could I do? Hmm, maybe I could add another bond right there. All right. Now I have eight electrons and I've satisfied my second goal. Okay, let's take a look at our last two rules. The first rule we have is the duet rule, which says that hydrogens must only have two electrons connected to it. Well, if we look at this hydrogen here, we see that there are two plus two, four electrons connected to the hydrogen. But the duet rule says that only two electrons can be connected to hydrogen. So our Lewis structure, therefore, must be wrong. I'm gonna go ahead and erase the two bonds that we added because those aren't right. If we keep it like this right now, we haven't satisfied the third rule, but we're satisfying the duet rule. Right now, both of these hydrogens only have two electrons. So the other way, instead of adding more bonds that we could help increase the number of electrons that were being used are something called lone pairs. And lone pairs are basically lone electrons which are being attached to the oh, to the atoms but aren't helping bond two atoms together. 
and we draw them in pairs of circles, just like so. So these are basically two electrons. So just like a bond, this is also a two. So if we look right now, we see that we actually have six electrons. And in order to get our full eight, let's add another lone pair of two electrons. All right, well now we see that in total we have two, four, six, eight. We have eight electrons being used, eight from right here. So that means all of our electrons are being used. We also see that our duet rule is still being followed. Hydrogen still has two electrons being attached to it, and this hydrogen over here still has two electrons being attached to it. And our last rule is our octet rule. Well, oxygen over here has two from this bond, two from this lone pair, two from this lone pair, and two from this bond over here. So also, oxygen has eight electrons. And voila, here we have our Lua structure for H2O. Okay, so the next structure that we're gonna draw is CO2, our carbon dioxide. And again, our first step is to figure out the total number of valence electrons that we have. Looking at our periodic table, we see carbon over here has four. And we see that oxygen has six. And I'm gonna draw two because we have two oxygens and we need to account for both. So we have a total of 14 electrons. Our next step is to figure out what is our central atom. And we see, our, according to our rule, the least electronegative element must be in the middle, unless we have carbon, which is always in the middle. And if we see in CO2, we have carbon. So I'm gonna put carbon in the middle, and I'm gonna put my two other atoms, my two other oxygens, around the carbon. I'm gonna go ahead and connect my oxygen with my carbon. I'm gonna go ahead and check off our first item on our list because we have our central atom down. And the next thing is to look at the number of electrons that we have used and make sure that in all we use 14 electrons according to this rule right here. Well, each bond equals two electrons. So this bond right here is two electrons and this bond right here is gonna be two electrons. Two plus two is four. So currently we've only used four electrons, but remember, we need to use 14 electrons. So one way that we could make sure we use more electrons is by adding more bonds, because each bond is two electrons. So let's go ahead and add in a bond on either side. And I'm gonna add in two also, because each bond is two electrons. So we have the two electrons for this bond, the two electrons for this bond, the two electrons for this bond, and the two electrons for this bond. And now in total we have eight electrons, still not 14. Well, if we're getting stuck and we don't really know what to do, we can go ahead and work from the other side down. Because it doesn't really matter which rules we satisfy first, as long as they're all satisfied in the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and go and look at the octet rule. Well, according to the octet rule, oxygen and carbon, and this oxygen over here, all need to have eight electrons surrounding it. Well, this carbon right here currently has two, four, six, eight. Perfect, it currently has eight electrons surrounding it. So it's satisfying the octet rule. This oxygen over here has two, four. It only has four electrons surrounding it because there are only two bonds touching it. So in order to fix this, we can go ahead and add in lone pairs. If you remember, lone, each lone pair is two electrons. So if I'm going to add in one lone pair, then I'm going to add in two electrons. And now this oxygen right here has two electrons from this lone pair, two electrons from this bond, and two electrons from this bond, and in total, six electrons, which still isn't satisfying my octet rule. So I'm going to add in another lone pair and therefore adding in two more electrons. Now, this oxygen has two, four, six, eight, eight electrons, satisfying our octet rule. I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at my other oxygen. Right now, this only has two bonds touching it, 
and therefore two, four, only four electrons surrounding it. But it needs to have eight, according to our octet rule again. So I'm going to add in two more lone pairs, just like I did to the first one. And I'm going to see that this is two, and this is two electrons. So now this has two, four, six, eight electrons touching it. And this is also satisfying our octet rule. Now, we don't really need to satisfy the duet rule, because the duet rule is for elements like hydrogen, with only two electrons surrounding it, and we don't have any hydrogens in CO2. So we're okay with that one. The last one is that all electrons are being used. And if we count, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons. Therefore, we are also satisfying our last rule. Okay, so over here, you'll notice that I have our CO2 Lewis structure that we just drew in our last example, but I also have a Lewis structure over here also for CO2. And if you look at our guidelines on the right side, you'll notice that this CO2 structure actually follows all of these Lewis structure rules, just like this CO2 structure. So it looks like there are two valid Lewis structures for CO2. And this can be confusing sometimes because we don't know which one's right, which one should we draw? Well, we're gonna figure out how to, how to see which Lewis structure is better. But first off, let's learn what, this, what the name of this is called. So, when you have multiple Lewis structures which work and which follow all of our Lewis structure rules, we call these resonance structures, and we symbolize this using a double arrow. And we see that they both work because they follow all the rules. In order to figure out which structure is in fact better between the two, we use something called formal charge. And for short, I'm just going to call it F. And formal charge equals the number of valence electrons minus the number of electrons assigned. So, for an example, in oxygen, the oxygen right here, the formal charge is the number of valence electrons, while the number of valence electrons on oxygen is 6 minus the number of electrons assigned to it. To figure out the number of electrons assigned to it, we're going to count lone pairs as two and bonds as one. So we have two, four, five, six. Okay. Do you see how we got that? We have two from this lone pair, two from this lone pair, one from this bond, and one from this bond, giving me a formal charge of zero. We're gonna do the same thing for the carbon in the middle. Carbon has a valence, has four valence electrons, and it has four bonds. Each bond equals one electron assigned to it. So you have one, two, three, four. Four minus four equals zero. Carbon also has a formal charge of zero. Looking at the other oxygen, we know that oxygen has six valence electrons. It also has two bonds. Two bonds means two electrons in total, and it has two lone pairs, each lone pair being two electrons. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six minus six again is zero. So all of the oxygens and the carbon on this CO2 have a formal charge of zero. And if we go ahead and take a look at the other CO2 structure, we see that oxygen over here also has six valence electrons, and it has and it has one bond, so that is one electron assigned to it, and it has three lone pairs, and each lone pair has two valence electrons. So we have two, four, six, seven. Six minus seven equals one. 
Looking at our carbon, we know that carbon has four valence electrons and it has four bonds connected to it. Remember, each bond equals one electron assigned to it. So we have one, two, three, four. Four minus four equals zero. And looking at the last oxygen, we see it has three bonds and one lone pair. Again, each bond is one, so we have one, two, three. And each lone pair is two, so we have two, three, and two, five. Again, oxygen has a valence electron of six, so six minus five is one. Okay, so after our calculations, I just went ahead and wrote the formal charges above each of our elements. And the next tool that we have to take a look at for formal charge is that we want the majority of our elements to have a formal charge of zero. So the more formal charges of zero, the more better the structure is. Well, if we see if this structure has three formal charges of zero, this structure only has one. So therefore, this structure is preferred and this is the better Lewis structure to draw. The other rule that you should know is that when there's a negative formal charge, it should be on the most electronegative element. If you can see here, oxygen is negative and oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So the negative part is okay, but because it only has one zero on this structure, we know this one is better because it has three. So now that hopefully you're starting to get the hang of drawing different Lewis structures and being able to figure out which Lewis structure is better if there are resonance structures, let's go ahead and take a look at a few exceptions to our first rule, the octet rule. So the first exception that we have is boron. Boron doesn't follow the octet rule. And instead of having eight electrons assigned to it, it only has six electrons. The second rule is beryllium. And instead of having eight, like the octet rule, it has four electrons as outer energy level. And our last rule is that any element in the third period, right here, this third period, or lower, can have more than eight electrons. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple examples just to see how this is being used. So let's take a look at the first example of BH3. We're gonna go ahead and start like we do every, every other problem and look at the valence electrons. So boron has three valence electrons, hydrogen has one because we have three hydrogens. We're going to add three ones, and we're going to notice that in total we have six valence electrons. We have six total electrons to use. Now we're going to look at our first rule and see what is the least electronegative element to go as our central atom. But we're going to also take a look and notice that we have hydrogen in our molecule. And hydrogen can never be our central atom. So with that in mind, we know that boron can be in the middle and we can put hydrogen around it and connect them like we always do. And now we can go ahead and start checking off our list. So we have to make sure all of our electrons are being used. Well, BH3 has six and right now we have two, four, six. Perfect. All of our electrons are being used. Now we have to check our do it rule for, for hydrogen. Make sure all of the hydrogens only have two electrons. Well, this has two, so that's good. This has two, and this has two. And remember, each bond has two, so that's where we're getting our twos from, so that's good. The last is the octet rule, meaning that, that the other elements should have eight electrons. Well, if we look at boron, we see two, four, six. Okay, so boron is not following the octet rule, and you might think that we drew our Lewis structure wrong. But we need to remember our exceptions to the octet rule. And if we look over here, we see boron should have six electrons. So when we count again, we see two, four, six, and voila, although it doesn't follow the octet rule, it follows our exceptions to the octet rule, so it's still okay. And, be, and this is a correct way of writing the Lewis structure for BH3. Now the other one is PCL5, and this is another example. 
have an exception to an octet rule. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, and chlorine has seven. And because we have five chlorines, I'm gonna go ahead and add those all up. And see, so we have 40 electrons. Phosphorus is less electronegative than chlorine, so I'm gonna go ahead and put phosphorus in the middle and draw my chlorines around it and draw our initial bonds. In order to follow our octet rule, I'm going to make sure that all the chlorines get 8 electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and draw 3 lone pairs around the chlorines. So that way, they'll have 8. And you can count up make sure 2, 4, 6, 8. Remember, each lone pair is 2, and each bond is 2. So in all, we have 8. So if we want to add up, and make sure we use all of our electrons. We can just add them up and see. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. We're using all of our electrons. Perfect. We don't have to worry about the duet rule because we have no hydrogens. And then we look at the octet rule. We know already that the chlorines have eight because we already counted that. But the phosphorus over here we see has two, four, six, eight, ten. Ten electrons rather than eight. But we have to remember our exception to the octet rule. Because phosphorus is in the third period or lower, phosphorus right here is in the third period, it is allowed to have more than eight electrons, so it's okay. And this right here is an correct way of drawing our Lewis structure for PCL5 and for BH3. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look at how to draw Lewis structures for polyatomic ions. Whenever we have a positive charge, we're going to subtract that from the total number of electrons that we count. Whenever we have a negative charge, we're going to add that to the total number of electrons that we have. So for an example, in our example of SO4, 2 minus, or sulfate, we have a charge of 2 minus. And according to our rule, when we have a minus charge or a negative charge, we add it to our total number of electrons. So as you can see, in my first step of drawing the Lewis structure, I have six valence electrons from sulfur, six valence electrons from oxygen, and four of them, because we have four oxygens, and then I added the two for to take into account the charge. I added in my negative charge. If this was a positive charge, if this was SO4, two plus positive, then I would have subtracted the two, because I'm subtracting positive charges. So once you've added in or subtracted your charge, you're going to treat the rest of the problem like any other Lewis structure problem. You're going to go ahead and add up the total number of electrons, which is equal to 32 in this case. And you're just going to draw your Lewis structure. So here I already drew it, but I'm going to walk you through the steps one more time. We found our least electronegative central, least electronegative element, the central atom, which was sulfur. And then I added in bonds between the sulfur and the four oxygens. And I made sure that I followed my octet rule by adding in lone pairs on all the oxygens so that each oxygen had eight electrons. How did I do that? I made sure that each lone pair like always, equals two electrons, and each bond is two electrons. And I went two, four, six, eight. So I knew that each had eight electrons. And then I made sure that sulfur also had eight electrons because sulfur also follows the octet rule. And I said two, four, six, eight. Four bonds, eight electrons, perfect. We're also following the octet rule. Now, we don't have to follow the duet rule again because we don't have any hydrogens in this problem. And last thing was to make sure all of our electrons are being used. So I just count them up. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. 
perfect. All 32 electrons are being used. Now the last step that's a little different for our polyatomic ions is you have to add brackets around your polyatomic ion and add in the charge. So in this case, it's a two minus charge. That way, when someone looks at the Lewis structure, they'll know it's a polyatomic ion with a two minus charge. So now that we've gone ahead and taken a look at how to draw many different types of Lewis structures, like for polyatomic ions, basic Lewis structures, Lewis structures which have exceptions to the octet rule, and Lewis structures where we have resonance structures and have to use formal charge. Let's go ahead and take a look at different categories of bonds. And we're going to use these three Lewis structures right here in order to help us learn how to categorize bonds. We have CH4, we have CO2, and we have N2. And we're going to use these to help us learn how to categorize. So the first category that we have is single, double, and triple bonds. This one is fairly straightforward and it kind of goes with the name. When you have one bond, we call it a single bond. When you have two bonds, like over here, we call it a double bond. And when we have three bonds right here, we call it a triple bond. One single, two double, three triple. And also, there's something called a multiple bond. And basically a multiple bond is another name for any bond which has more than one bond. So right here, because it has two bonds, this right here is two bonds, we could call it double or we could call it a multiple bond. Right here, because it has three bonds, which is more than one, we can call it also a multiple bond. We can't call this a multiple bond because there's only one. Okay, so the next category is bond energy. Bond energy is basically how much energy it takes to form or break a bond. The more stronger a bond is, the higher bond energy it has. And the weaker the bond is, the less bond energy it has. And this makes sense because if you have a stronger object, usually it takes more force or more energy for you to break it. But if you have a weaker object, it isn't as hard to break. You don't have to put as much energy into it. We can see this in an example of a potato chip. A potato chip isn't very strong, so it doesn't take me a lot of energy to break it. I don't have to put that much energy into it. But if we take a much stronger object, like a carrot, I have to put a lot of energy to break the carrot. It has a higher bond energy, we can say in our analogy. So likewise, like a potato chip, one bond is very weak. So it has a lower bond energy. But a stronger bond, like a triple bond, has a much higher bond energy. It takes a lot more energy to break it and to form it. Now we can say this double bond right here will have a bond energy between this one and this one. We can say it kind of has a middle bond energy. Not too high and not too low. The next category is bond length. Bond length depends on how strong a bond is. The stronger the bond, the shorter the length of the bond is. And vice versa. The weaker the bond, the longer it is. You can think of this because if you have two different objects, the farther the way they are, the less attraction they are, the less strong they are. But when they're closer together, because there is barely any distance, they're more attracted to each other and they're more stronger. So as a result, you can see because this one is very weak, we can assume it has a longer bond length. It's, so, it's very far apart, so it's weak. Well, on the other hand, this one is very strong. So we can assume it has a shorter bond length because the objects aren't, because both of the hydrogens aren't far apart, they have a stronger attraction to each other. And again, because this has two, we can assume its bond length is in between this one and this one. Bond order is also very easy and it corresponds to the number of bonds. A single bond has a bond order of one. 
a double bond has a bond order of two, and a triple bond has a bond order of three, just like in their names. The last category is sigma and pi bonds. Sigma bonds exist in regions between two bonded atoms, and pi bonds exist in regions between or below two bonded atoms. In more simpler terms, all bonds have sigma bonds, and the rest of the bonds are pi bonds. So, because this is a, a single bond, it just has, it has, because of the bond, it has one sigma bond, like all bonds, and because it's just one bond, we only need one sigma bond and zero pi. This right here is a double bond. And like all bonds, it has one sigma bond. And we have one here. But this is, these are two bonds. So to make up for the one we're missing, we're going to add a pi. Finally, over here, like all bonds, this triple bond has one sigma bond. And to make up for, and as you see, this has one bond, but this is a triple bond. So we're going to make up for those other two bonds that we don't have, and we're going to put pi bonds there. So, in conclusion, when you add up the number of sigma and pi bonds, you should get the number of bonds that you have. 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 1 plus 2 is 3. So now that we are able to draw Lewis structures and categorize our bonds, the next step is to be able to understand how to translate a mere Lewis structure on your paper like this into an actual 3D model and be able to learn how to predict what your 3D model is going to look like. The way that we can do this is using VSEPR. VSEPR stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion and VSEPR helps us predict the shapes of our molecules. Our VSEPR model can help us determine things like the electron group shape, molecular shape, bond angles, polarity, and hybridization. And to do all of this, we need to find something called the steric number. So, the steric number that we just talked about is the total number of electron domains on the central atom in a molecule. Or more simply put, it's the number of sides where there's either a bond or a lone pair on the central atom. For example, let's look at BeCl2. In BeCl2, Be is the central atom, and it has a steric number of 2 because, as you can see, two sides of Be have either a lone pair or have a bond. The other sides don't have anything. So we can say Be has a steric number of 2. and we can predict that the molecule looks something like this, with BE in the middle and CL2 on both sides. Now we call something like this, with the steric number of two, linear. So we call this linear. And that is the name of the electron group shape. In order to find the bond angle, we have to find the angle between the two bonds. So we can figure out that this angle right here, since it's a straight line, since it's linear is 180. So anything with a steric number of 2 is going to have an electron group shape of linear and have a bond angle of 180. Like I mentioned before, there are a lot more things which we can learn about a molecule and about the 3D shape of it using VSEPR. But for now, we're going to leave off with this basic introduction that we learned in this video. We quickly covered how to find the electron group shape and the bond angle of a molecule with a steric number of 2, and how to, how to find the steric number of a molecule in general. There are many different charts online, such as this one, which help you understand the different patterns of VSEPR and how to predict different molecules. You can use these charts to memorize the different traits that we talked about before. 
and watch more videos about how to use Vesper so that you can understand how to create models for molecules that don't have a steric number of two, but maybe a steric number of three, four, or five. Thank you for watching.